Hey there, Momentum Church. Welcome to our online service. Uh, I'm Pastor Josh. I'll be your host this morning, which basically just means I'm saying, hey, letting you know a little bit of info about announcements, and then uh, I'll let you go upstairs and, and listen to our worship team, listen to Pastor Sean's message, uh, but mostly just, just wanted to say hey and connect. So if you're watching this morning, drop us a comment down below. Let us know that you're here. Hit that thumbs up button just so that we know what, that you're here and we know who's watching and uh, we could kind of build a little relationship that way. Just so you know, uh, I, I take care of most of the stuff that goes on on our Facebook page. And so if you ever drop us a message, uh, there's a really good chance that I'm the one that sees it first. And so if you ever need anything, just, just from a... Uh, a pastoral perspective, or you need somebody to talk to, or you need somebody to chat with, uh, that is a, a, a great way to get a hold of us. And, and like I said, most of the time you'll end up with me. So, hey, nice to meet you. Uh, <laughs> now when you need somebody to talk to, you know, uh, you know what I look like. So <laughs> um, I'm just doing this here from my office this week, trying to keep things kind of casual. Um, so as far as announcements, things going on here at Momentum Church, a couple of pretty big things going on. Uh, the first one, we have been talking for a couple months now about this uh, building a new student center and remodeling our entryway. And we're super excited to say that we've had some pretty major moves forward in those. So uh, out in our, what is currently the overflow, what will soon be the new entry of, when, entryway of our church. Uh, we've got some massive new doors that are gonna be going into the wall here soon. Um, if you live here in Colville and you ever stop into our physical campus or you just drive by, you'll start noticing some big changes uh, outside at the, the new entrance. Uh, but then on the opposite side of our property where our current youth house is, uh, in the next couple months, you're going to notice some even bigger changes over there as our current youth house is going to disappear. Uh, Hope Street, which is uh, an organization that helps house uh, homeless people or people in need, has purchased that or is in the process of uh, purchasing and moving that building to make space for our new building that can house uh, all of the kids in our youth group. So super excited about that. Uh, but just know that God's doing big things. And sometimes when big things happen, uh, stuff gets a little messy. So if you make your way into our physical campus, you might run into some construction mm -hmm. stuff, uh, but just know that's that's because God's got stuff going down and we're excited about it. Um, next thing that we want you to know about is our winter camp. So speaking of youth group, uh, if you have a student or you are a student, grades six through 12, uh, this January the 13th through the 26th, we have winter camp going on at Silver Lake, which is, um, is near Medical Lake outside of Spokane. So we're hoping to take as many kids as possible. We're partnering up with about 15 other churches to put this on. Um, we've got an amazing uh, set of speakers that are gonna be there. We have an incredible worship team that will be there. There will be ice skating and games of all kinds. Um, it's gonna be a ton of fun. So you can go to uh, momentum.church, M-M-N-T-M.church. That's our website. And uh, from there, go to events. And from there, you will see our winter youth camp. And right there on the website uh, are links that you can register your student. You can pay for your student. You can get all of the information you need to know. Permission slips, uh, code of conduct slips, all of that is right there on our website. So go check that out. Sign your kids up today. Um, and uh, we're just excited for what God's going to do in their lives at this camp. We believe that he's got big things in store for all of our students. So those are my announcements for you this week. Uh, again, we're just super glad that you're here. Uh, super thankful for you being a part of what God is doing in our church and uh, look forward to hearing from you about what God is doing in your life and through you to the people around you. So we love you. Sure glad that you're here. We're going to send you on upstairs for some worship and a message. And uh, if you ever need anything, please reach out to us and let us know. We consider you a part of our church family just as much as anyone else. And we, we want to get you involved. So we love you. We'll see you real soon.
death could not hold you the veil tore before you you silenced the boast of sin and grave the heavens are roaring the praise of ourselves in sometimes those words are all that we really need to know that there is power in the name of Jesus that in those moments that we look at our life and we feel lost and we don't know what direction to go or the direction we want to go feels wrong or hard or and it's so reach out and, and take a hold of that. Put your trust in me and in me alone and I will lead you. I will guide you. My word is a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. My spirit is there to walk alongside you. My son is there 
to be the propitiation for your sin, that all that you have and all that you need is found in me. God, I thank you that those are your words to us this morning. There is power in you. Give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken.
are all worshiping, but I'm so thankful that when we get in our cars and we go home and we get stuck behind somebody that's driving five miles an hour under the speed limit and, and, and things are frustrating, there's still worship in that moment, that your presence is still with us in that moment. Lord, I even thank you that in, in two minutes when this song is over and, and we come to the time to give our tithes and offerings, that's still worship. Just like the song says, when the music is over, our worship doesn't end. When we open our word and, and Pastor Sean leads us, God, that's still worship. When we get home and we play in the snow with our kids, that's still worship. When we get to work on Monday morning, when we work hard, that's still worship. God, I pray that our lives, everything that we are, all that we are, would be an expression of our love for you. You say that you created us so that we would worship you. So God, allow, allow us that. Encourage us in that, in all that we say, in all that we do, in all that we are. May we worship you and you alone because you are worthy. In Jesus' great name we pray. Amen. All of our younger saints would like to stand up. You can go to kids' church. <laughs> well, to make it easier on the adults. <laughs> I love kids. I love kids. Okay, we'll let the littles go. <laughs> I love kids children. Okay, if the people that are going to help us receive the offering will come forward. This is a part of our giving. Hey there. Right now we is our to opportunity give to give. To Here at Momentum, we say that we yeah. are goers. And one of the ways that we go, we go in giving. So would you just take the moment, the opportunity to give? Uh, I thank you so much for all of you that are so generous and make a difference in the kingdom of God because of your giving. Can I just pray over this moment of worship? Jesus, thank you so much for the opportunity to give. We thank you that we get to partner with what you're doing at Momentum Church. Bless everyone that is giving and uh, keep moving us towards you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Is that the deal? Everybody. All right, you may be seated. Last one standing gets to preach. That joke is running out. Uh, <laughs> it's still standing. <laughs> Here we go. Let's, uh, let's pray and then we'll get moving. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and your great mercy to us. God, I ask that you would have your way. I believe in expectancy of what you are about to do in all of our lives. And so, Jesus, this morning we come to you and ask that you would move us towards you, that you would speak to each one of our hearts, that you begin the groundwork right now, God, that you would, you would uh, deepen our desire for you and your word. Give us life in the name of Jesus. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Genesis chapter 45. But as you turn to Genesis chapter 45, I just want to uh, tell you a story. And the story is about me and my tendencies. So when I was younger, I had this habit of going overboard with pretty much everything. That habit hasn't really, I'm working on it, right? So Debbie won't start anything with me because she's afraid that I will go overboard, right? So when I was younger, I remember my mom, my mama, a single mom, uh, just a, a teenager when I was born, and she would, she would start stuff. And I remember once uh, she started a water fight. And, uh, and that water fight was just a simple, like, uh, splash of a glass of water or something like that. It was really simple, really simple. Uh, in my habit of going overboard with things, I went outside and got the hose and ran it inside the house and sprayed down my mom, right? And so, so that was one time. There was this other time where we were in, uh, I was staying with a family in Goldendale. We were having a water fight again. And, it's, and it was hot, you know, you can feel the sun burning. I just had a pair of shorts and we we're, we're having a water fight. And uh, somebody ran into the house. And I just, I just remembered that one time where I brought the hose into the house. Uh, so I didn't go, uh, I wasn't bringing water to the house, but I was certainly chasing somebody. And so I was chasing after them. And again, in my tendency to go overboard, I was running after them. They ran into the house and then I, I followed after and slam right into the glass door. Yes. Good news. I didn't break it that time. But of all these stories, I, I find myself, the message today is that that one kid, that one kid that took things too far, that one kid that said too much, that one th- kid that, that went beyond the line was usually me. And that one kid was needed to be given extra grace. Because I, I, that was just my tendency. And I don't know about you, and I don't know what your family looks like, but I wonder if you have someone in your family like me. Sometimes that someone is called Crazy Uncle Billy. You know who he is, right? They show up and, oh, it's, oh that's Crazy Uncle Billy. You just know automatically that you're to give them grace. Do you have a crazy uncle, uncle Billy? Raise your hand. Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, you're probably crazy Uncle Billy. <laughs> it's funny about families. This is an interesting mix of characters, but with this mix of characters, you don't know what you're going to get. And so as we prepare for gathering of families and friends and all kinds of folks, 
I wonder what it would look like if at the get-go you look at your family with a little extra grace. Now, this morning we're talking about a family, but this family is broken and awful, actually. So, so we look at this family, we've got all these boys, and, and there was this one kid, there was this one kid, and this kid was given all kinds of privileges. He was elevated above everybody else, and everybody knew it, that daddy's favorite was this kid. And not only daddy's favorite was this kid, but he would send him out to go do certain things, and in sending them out, Uh, they would see this brother of theirs and they would find themselves not giving extra grace but getting boiled up and angry. And that anger led to to all kinds of things but but especially that anger led to harm towards their brother. Not only did it lead to harm towards their brother but it also led to harm towards their father. And in a moment, they, they, they decided that they were done with their brother and they were going to kill him. And one of the brothers decides, oh, no, 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 let's not kill him. Let's just throw him in the pit. And then just at the right moment, uh, a group comes by and then they take their brother, they pull him out of the pit and they sell him. This is their brother, their blood, their family. And this is all because of this desire to get back, to to get back what was theirs. And in this selling of their brother, they took his coat and brought it to their father, and then they began this lie. Can you imagine the guilt and shame you would feel as a sibling of this guy named Joseph? All the, the anger, all this, all this stuff, all of a sudden you respond, you take it into your own hands, and then, and then you carry the shame. Every moment that you would look at your father, you would see his despair, his heartache, his sorrow, all caused by a decision that started way back in the beginning where a little grace could have been given. And we see this picture. And if you know this story, you know that, that from this moment, Joseph went through all kinds of things. You know, he was, he was uh, in, a, in a household. He was lied about, thrown in prison, said that he'd get out, get out of prison, but still left there. And then from that moment, he was let out of prison later on. He interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams, so on and so forth. The Pharaoh goes, hey, you've got something about you. All these circumstances that happened to him. The Bible says over and over and over again that in the midst of his circumstance, that God was with him every single time. That God was with them, that God was with them, that God was with them. And he went through awful circumstances. And so he becomes number two in the kingdom, uh, the most powerful nation in the world. And that is where we pick up. Well, actually, that's not where we pick up. Where we pick up is that there's this famine. And uh, Joseph's family in another country is, is hungry. They're running out of food. There's none. And so they go to Egypt because they heard that there's food there. And you can read more about it, but we're going to pick up in verse 4. So read on it on your own, but verse 4. So here are Joseph and his brothers standing before him. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother, Joseph. Could you imagine this moment? Now picture all the brothers, all the shame, the guilt, 
the pain, the sorrow that they caused their father, but also that they carried themselves. And here Joseph is in front of them, and and he's got this opportunity. He's got this opportunity to get them really good, right? Do you remember what they did to him? Do you remember all the circumstances that they caused to him? Do you remember all the things, the pain, the sorrow, the shame that he, all that he was experienced? And here he is, and he says to them, I am your brother, Joseph, the one that you sold into slavery. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Wait, can I just stop there? Did you read that? I mean, I was thinking about this, and I've been agonizing uh, about this message since, since I started prepping for it. I, I'm looking at this guy, and how could he get to this point? How could he get to this point where these brothers lied to his father, sold him into slavery, wanted to harm him, hated him, let their anger get so big that they wanted to destroy their own flesh and blood? How could that, how could that happen? And here they are, and he, 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 he says, hey, I'm your brother. And then on top of that, he says, and now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Wow. As I was processing this message, I was, God, what would it take? What would it take for me to take what has been harmed, what has been done to me, and say, oh, oh, don't get upset with yourselves. Oh, don't get upset with yourselves. Don't be distressed. Don't be angry with yourselves. What would it take? And I've been processing and looking at this, and the first thing that I come up with is this. The first thing that it would take is for me to check myself, to check myself, right? So his brothers had these many moments where they saw all these things that that just kept making him mad and more mad, and they wanted to get back at him. But instead of checking themselves, instead of, instead, of, instead of evaluating where their heart was, instead of going, hey, wait, 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 I need to recognize what's going on inside of me. I need to see that I need to give Joseph grace. It's, instead, of, instead of doing that, they just simmered more and more and more and more and more and became so angry that it consumed them. So if I were Joseph, what would I need to do? I would need to check myself. I need to check myself. I would need to see, God, what what is it in me that I'm letting consume me so much that that I want to harm them? So we stay, take a step back and we recognize that. There's this Bible verse in Ecclesiastes 7 to 9, and it says this, Do not be quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Wow. Let me, let me say that In another way, if we don't forgive those that harm us, what happens is resentment takes control. If we don't forgive those that harm us, resentment takes control. Isn't that true? I mean, let's just take a step back and just think about all the different circumstances. So in order for me to forgive uh, brothers that harm me in such a way, I, I think I would need to check myself. Where, where, where am I going with this? 
Am I letting it consume me? Colossians 3.13 says this, Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. So we look at this verse, or sometimes I look at the verse, and, and man, God has forgiven me of so much. But I don't recognize that that often, to be honest. Forgive as the Lord forgave me. Now, now let's take a step back. If we're supposed to check ourselves, then, then the truth is, is that we have to know that we're just as flawed and broken as the one that's doing the harm. But, but the harm maybe isn't towards other people, but sometimes it's towards God. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So it's this picture that my sin causes harm. But we see all throughout the Bible, we see this picture of Jesus, and we see that Jesus came to give life and life to the fullest. So what that means, that he forgives me a ton. Even though I was still at war with God, he loved me. Wow. So let me ask you this. If you, if you have like a problem or an issue with someone, or uh, how, when was the last time you checked yourself? When was the last time you looked at God's graciousness, his mercy, his forgiveness towards you and go, oh, thank you, God. And then you applied it to someone else. In order for us to forgive like Joseph, we must check ourselves. Now, there's this second part of this verse, chap chapter 5, that I want to read. And now, do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me. Look at that word. The next word is because. Would you circle that if you have it on a paper Bible? It was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Okay, so not only is he checking himself, not, not only is he, he, he checking his heart, but, but he is, he's cooperating with what God wants to do. He, he's saying, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not in control, but God is. And I may have gone through circumstances. I may have gone through pain. I may have gone through sorrow. But, but I, I'm going to cooperate with God and see what he does with this. So in order for us to be like Joseph, to, to forgive like Joseph, to navigate family life like Joseph, we have to check ourselves. We, we have to cooperate with what God is doing. Here's another way to say it. We have to relinquish control. I think about that picture. I mean, the Old Testament, we, we go through the Old Testament, we see that, that eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Yeah, get them good, right? We see this picture. But, but the application of that is completely wrong. Here, let me help you with this. So think about a culture and a society that has no laws, that has no boundaries. And then think about that in regards to relationships. Right? If you apply eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, if we apply it at a personal level, when does it stop? If you're a kid like me, it doesn't stop. You just keep trying to top the next person, right? It's this never-ending, oh, get him. I'm going to 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 get him. Back and forth, back and forth, which creates more harm, which creates more pain, which creates more sorrow. 
So the application of that piece of scripture, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, now take it at the law level, the governing level. If, if, if Bob harms me and we go to court, right? Because I, uh, let's make me the bad guy. So I steal a ton of stuff from Bob. And he's like, hey, I need you to give it back. And no, 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 and we have to go to court, right? So that's saying an eye for an eye. So if I stole $1,000 from Bob, there's my limit. Maybe plus interest or whatever, right? So then there's this boundary that we could see on how to prosecute people, right? How to have law in a society. Now, go back to that eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. That picture is me taking the law into my own hands. It's me being the judge and jury. Isn't it? And here we see Joseph, who was the law of the land. He could have done anything that he wanted to do. But instead of taking control, instead of being in control of the situation, he cooperated with God. He, he let God handle it. And I would suggest that he let God handle it way at the beginning. Because he had all these moments to relinquish control. And you know what he did? He did it. So when we look at crazy Uncle Billy or whatever we're facing, first need to check ourselves. Second, we need to cooperate with God. Verse 7. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you for you a remnant on the earth to save your lives by a great deliverance. Wow. He's still looking at this picture of, of, of I'm going to relinquish control to God. I'm going to cooperate with what he's doing. Verse 8. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. Again, he's continuing to cooperate with God. He's continuing to go the bigger picture. And instead of relinquish, instead of uh, putting harm on them, I mean, you've heard that saying, hurt people hurt people. Don't you? Yeah, haven't you heard that saying? Right? Yeah. So I've been hurt a lot. So that gives me the opportunity to, to harm other people. No. Here, Joseph had that opportunity. And what did he do? Instead of, instead of perpetuating, instead of perpetuating this picture of hurt people, hurt, hurting people, he pictured, he painted a different picture. He stopped it there. He could have continued on with this chain that's been in his life, has been in his family's life. I mean, his father hurt people. His brothers hurt people. Now it's his opportunity. He could show his kids. He could show his kids how to do this. But instead, we see this picture of grace. We see this picture of forgiveness. Now, this picture of forgiveness is this thing that's, that's instant. What do you mean it's instant? As soon as he extends forgiveness, it's given. Forgiveness is always given. I mean, think about the picture of that. Forgiveness is given. Trust, on the other hand, is earned. So we see this picture of forgiveness, but we also see this picture of, of Joseph keeping these boundaries. Sometimes we, we're in situations where we're, we're harmed by someone and we put ourselves back into that situation. That's not forgiveness. 
Forgiveness is given. Trust is earned. So we see this picture, and we should grab hold of this, that just because you forgive someone doesn't mean you should automatically trust them or put your life in that situation again. We see Joseph checking himself. We see him cooperating. Now, what is the result of that? Look at verse 15. Oh, I got to read 14 too. And then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him, weeping. And he kissed all his brothers. Way back up. He kissed all his brothers? Wait, wait a minute. Do you remember the harm that they did to him? He kissed all of his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers, what did they do? They talked with him. See, this picture of grace in this moment brings healing. This picture of grace in this moment brings peace. The picture of grace in this moment brings life. I mean, just think about that picture. They were completely estranged for good reason. And when he brings grace to the moment, we see this amazing result. Restoration, healing, and peace. And what's interesting, if you flip over to chapter 50, verse 20. Oh, I got to read 19 too. Uh, verse 19. So we see that, they, that he responded with grace, which made room for change, but also made room for peace in the situation. But look at his brothers in verse 19. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? So turmoil happened in their family again. Dad passed away, and they start trying to lie their way and to get in favor from their brother. <laughs> they're breaking trust again. And they're upset. They're afraid that all these things are going to happen. But here's what happens. Verse 20. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. So we see Joseph, he checked himself. We see Joseph, he cooperated with God. Instead of taking control, he relinquished control. We see Joseph confess. He confessed it. So what you did was evil. What you did was to harm me. He gave it a name. There, there's something amazing about this picture of confession, of, of naming it, right? It says, I, I know that this happened. I'm recognizing what, what just happened, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it what it is. He confessed it. But not only did he confess it, but he also, he also confessed God's power, right? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, change. So we see this picture that, that Joseph, he checked himself. That Joseph, he cooperated with what God wanted to do. And Joseph, he confessed it. He named it. He, he knew what it was. But then Joseph also recognized that in the midst of confession, following confession comes change. Now, how did, how did he change? What did that look like? 
You intended it for good, uh, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. change when he confessed he put God's intention over theirs he put God's intention over theirs wow Many of us have heard this verse in Romans 8, 28. It says, God works all things together for the good of those that love him according to his purposes. It's this picture that in everything that I face, that God is greater, that God can redeem this, that God can change it, God can make it whole, but God's picture is greater than mine. And the truth is, is that God's intention is always the same. We would say it here, God wants to move people towards Jesus. And we expectantly accept that. <laughs> Let me go deeper with that. He wants to use you to move others towards Jesus. Now, what does that look like as we navigate all this season of all kinds of life? If, if we were to take this picture and, and put it in an image, I would do it like this. And life, God wants us to forgive. He wants us to bring life to the situation. And we do that by first checking ourselves, by, by checking ourselves, by cooperating with God, relinquishing control of the situation, relinquishing the desire, the urge to get someone back and get them good. We do this by confessing it, calling what it is. And we do this by moving towards change. And how do we do all of that? The truth is, is we can't without God's help. We can't. But with God's help, what happens is he brings life to the situation. And in that life, he stirs things up. And he brings peace. And he brings hope. So this morning, I want to ask you a question. Where are you at in this picture? If you were to take a moment and to check yourself, are, are you finding yourself to go and, and get somebody and get them good? Are you finding yourself to, to believe the best and to bring forgiveness to the table, to bring hope and peace and life? Are you willing to relinquish control, cooperate with God? Let him handle it. Let the vengeance be on his hands and not yours. Are you willing to confess it, call it what it is? When you said this, when you did this, it hurt. Are you willing to live in change. Would you please stand with me this morning?
the ushers come on forward and the worship team, please. plates are right here, Brenda. So where are you at with this? So this morning we're going to do this a little differently. You're going to be passed a plate and you're going to take one of these items in this plate and when you're ready you're going to come forward and you're going to put your little tablet into this one of these jars of water there's one here there's one here and there's one here now this is what you're committing to the next time that you're faced with the similar moment where you need to forgive that you're going to make a commitment to add life to the situation, which means that you're going to give grace in the midst of the situation. Maybe you're here, and, and the truth is, is that you have been harmed. And you're trying so hard to forgive. And you're not sure how. And so you're going to take one of these and you're going to come forward and you're going to put it in one of these jars. Saying, God, I commit. Commit to change. I don't know how to do this. I can't. I can't carry this anymore. And so you're going to throw it in that jar and you're going to just release it. You're relinquishing control. Jesus, I don't know how you're going to work this out, but I trust that you can. So I'm trusting you with this. Would you just take a moment to bow your heads as the ushers pass these plates? I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Jesus, forgiveness is so hard. (laughs) I so often don't want to do it. I ask that you help me to do it. That you help us to do it. Lord Jesus, please give us an extra grace and help us give grace to others. In Jesus' name, amen. When you're ready, as the song is being sung, please respond. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my Of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. So 
forgiven and then something happens and it pokes us and all of a sudden it all flares up again and it challenges us. It challenges me to keep going back and saying, God help me forgive. God help me forgive. God help me forgive. And I was thinking as pastor was preaching, can you imagine the impact we will have on this community if we live lives forgiving others? If the way of life we have is to forgive those that poke the bear, can you imagine what we will do in this community, showing them a better way? I, I just think it's going to be amazing. And I know it really challenged my heart because sometimes I think I've forgiven and I think I've forgiven. And then when the Holy Spirit touches me, he says, ah, still got to work on that a little bit more. So I'm going to say have a blessed week. Let's together keep forgiving, keep forgiving, keep forgiving because God has been so wonderful to forgive us even when we don't deserve, well, we never deserve it, but he still richly pours his forgiveness out on us. Let's do that to the community around us and show them what the love of God is. So go and be blessed and show forgiveness this week. You're dismissed.